Okay, you can turn in your Bible today to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to continue our study on pre-trib rapture scriptures in the Pauline epistles. We've already done Romans, and then we did 1 Corinthians, so this week we're going to do 2 Corinthians. So, we're going to start out here in chapter 1. There's not as many in 2 Corinthians, um, but uh, definitely some interesting things here. And of course, you have to keep in mind that uh, when you go through the Pauline epistles, you will see the theme of eternal security uh, for the truly saved, born-again Christian. Um, you are sealed until the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of promise, according to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be looking at that uh, two studies from now. And so you have that. You'll see this theme of you don't have to worry about losing your salvation, but you would if you go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, and you also see the thing of faith and works set up as a salvation thing there in the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, I've documented that in many other studies. So, those are a couple big things there that you'll see. And of course, you know, we are given uh, admonitions in the Pauline epistles to witness to anybody. Okay, anybody can get saved, uh, including sodomites or the most wicked perverse people out there. They can all get saved and born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, not so when you go into the time of Jacob's trouble. In the time of Jacob's trouble, if somebody takes that mark of the beast, they're done. You can't, uh, I mean, don't even waste your time witnessing to somebody like that. They can't be saved. So again, there are a lot of differences between what we have now in what people call the church age and what will come in the time of Jacob's trouble. And that is the correct term for it. It's not really called the tribulation. Again, as I've said in other studies, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it says here, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, comfort, you know, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You know, it's interesting because if you turn over to 1 Thessalonians, where you read about uh, one of the accounts of, of the detailed account of the rapture, the catching away of the bride of Christ. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18 says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, it's a comfort knowing that the wrath that's about to come on this planet, and it's coming very soon, it's a comfort to know as a Christian we're not going to face that. And you say, well, the wrath is, you know, that wrath doesn't come until later. That's one of the biggest lies of these post-trib liars out there. Okay, that's a deceit of these people. Um, to say that the wrath is somehow later on, and, you know, I, I, I know uh, Ken Hoven says, uh, he'll say, tribulation is what man does to man, and wrath is what God does to man, or something. That's foolish nonsense. Okay, the wrath is there from day one. Right, when the Antichrist is unleashed and that mark of the beast thing is set up, you take the mark, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 11 that God's wrath comes upon you. So don't tell me the wrath comes later. And you know, I mean, God unleashing the Antichrist on the earth, uh, I think that might be wrath. Okay, you know, look at Zephaniah chapter 3, it talks about God's fierce indignation, how he gathers the nations together. Okay, that happens at the beginning. So don't fall for this lie that the wrath somehow, we're post-trib pre-wrath. That is stupid nonsense. All right, It is a comfort to know that we as Christians are not going to be going through God's wrath or His judgment that He brings upon the world that has forsaken Him. All right, The whole purpose of this time that's coming, as I, again, as I've said many times, it's for the nation of Israel. It is, that's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel's 70th week, determined upon thy people, Israel. The whole thing is for the Jews. That's why there's signs and wonders. That's why you have seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. Signs, 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 signs. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Jews require a sign. It all makes sense. All you got to do is just be a Christian that rightly divides the word of truth. If you try to make everything blend together, the whole New Testament, Matthew to Revelation, you're just going to make a mess of Scripture. It does not blend together all for one group here. It doesn't work that way. But you see there, we have a comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18. It's a comfort to know that as bad as the world is getting, we're going to be leaving soon. You know, I'm going to post a link uh, down there in the description box to a beautiful old hymn called Face to Face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. It's a beautiful old hymn. And, and it's sung a cappella in this, in this video. It's really, really a beautiful thing. Nice to listen to when you start to see all the evil things out there in the world and realize, you know, face to face I shall behold him. You know, I'm, we're going to see him. It's going to be great to see each other. You know, sure, absolutely. But we're actually going to get to see Jesus. Isn't that a comfort to you? But if you believe, like a lot of the post-trib pre-wrath liars are teaching, that the Antichrist is coming and you might possibly not make it to the end, how is that a comfort? I mean, Paul writes and says that God comforted us, us in all our tribulation. You say, well, see, Christians go through the tribulation. See, that's, that's where these guys will get you on these little word games. They'll say it's the tribulation or the great tribulation. That doesn't appear anywhere in the King James Bible as a title. It's a description. We go through tribulation right now. All right? If you're truly saved, you've gone through some tribulation of some kind. Be it family going through after you or, or you know, money problems or health problems or whatever else. You have tribulation. But you know what the comfort is? knowing it's all going to be worth it someday. You know, the, another old song, another old hymn, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. That's what Christians look forward to. We don't look and say, well, Oh, the body of Christ is just so wicked, so we're going to have to go through seven years of being purified, or three and a half if you want to go with that. <laughs> what? You know? <laughs> Absurd. And you know, while I'm on that point, I just want to make a point here. Uh, I know Brother Jeffrey Greider put this article up, and then uh, Jim Beckwith, he had it on his channel. And I just want to make a point here really quickly. Keep your hand there in Second Corinthians. Of, we're just going to go back. I want to show you this thing because it was such a good point. Go back to the book of Daniel. Comes right after the book of Ezekiel. Daniel, I think it's chapter 8. Uh, Daniel. Okay, no, I'm sorry. Daniel chapter 9. I was thinking chapter 8. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Okay, it says here, Seventy weeks are de determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Um, that's Christians? No, it's the Jews. To finish the transgression... And to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Um, haven't those things already happened for Bible-believing Christians? Yes. We already have had all those things fulfilled for us as Christians. But the nation of Israel hasn't. And I've seen some very radical Jewish rabbis that reject Jesus Christ, and they're teaching right now that the time of Jacob's trouble is coming. And at the end will come the Messiah. That's what the text is saying right there. What they don't realize, a lot of these guys, is it's actually a second coming. Jesus Christ came. He is the Messiah. He'll be coming back. So, very interesting. And you say, well, how do you know he's coming back? Let me show you that real quick. Because I know that there are some Jews that watch and they'll say, well, you know, the, the Messiah, he came, or he's only going to come, he's going to do everything the first time. So Jesus, he came and he didn't fulfill the whole thing. Uh, well, I'm going to show you about that real quick. While we're here, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9. 
And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Okay? Verse 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Okay? That's something that happened in the past. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadad Rimon in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart, all the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. Okay? So, they see him and they're mourning and saying, we pierced him. It's a second coming. The first time he came, they crucified him. When he came as their Messiah, they killed him. That's what's happening there. That's why when they see him, they're mourning. I mean, if the if the Messiah comes and it's the first time that he's come, why are they mourning? Doesn't make any sense. The Messiah shows up for the first time at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, and the Jews mourn. Why? No, they're mourning because they realize we rejected him the first time, and all those Jews that died went to hell. If you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you go to hell. You say, but the, you know, God made a special covenant. I don't care. Jesus Christ is the way into heaven. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The Jews that rejected Jesus down through the centuries are in hell burning. They missed it. That's why there's mourning there in the book of Zechariah. They look on him in whom they have pierced. There is a second coming. Well, let's continue. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 21 and 22 it says here now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the spirit in our hearts interesting because over in the book of Ephesians chapters 1 and chapter 4 it talks about being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise so what does this text tell us this text it says hath anointed us you know he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, God the Father, who, speaking about God, hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Okay? So we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise in the book of Ephesians. Here it says it's God that sealed us. What does that tell you? God and the Holy Spirit are one. Jesus Christ is God. All right? The Godhead. But it's interesting there, given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. You know, you will have a, a, a kind of an earnest outlook on life if you are truly saved. When you truly get saved, you're going to realize, wow, there's a lot of people going to hell. You're going to have a burden for the lost. You're going to have that ministry of reconciliation. You're going to want to see people get saved. There's an earnest desire there to see people get saved. And there's also an earnest desire to go to be with the Lord. Paul talked about, to, for to me live is Christ and to die is gain. He's anxious. There's an earnestness there. There's, there's, a, there's a desire just like, oh man, I just want to go to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. and I'm looking forward to it. We look forward to the rapture. Why would I look forward to the end times if I believed I was going into the time of Jacob's trouble? Daniel's 70th week. Why would I look forward to that? I have the earnest in my spirit, you know, that I'm going to go into that time and probably going to lose my salvation because I take the mark or something because I have to provide for my wife and, and son, you know. And it's weird. It's a weird thing that these post-tribbers come up with. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. I like this one too here. It says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Okay? Very interesting because if you would compare that to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, where it talks about God sending strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. If you compare those scriptures, 
uh, the people that go into the time of Jacob's trouble are ignorant of Satan's devices. Why? Because God sends them strong delusion. Now, why would God send strong delusion upon his own body? He sealed us there in chapter 1, verse 22. God seals us. He comforts us. And he's going to send us strong delusion? Huh? What? And believe me, if you think, well, Christians have it all figured out, brother. I mean, we, we Christians know exactly what's going on with the evil world and everything else, and they are not deceived in any part. Uh, I really hate to tell you, Christians have been deceived quite a bit, myself included. I've been deceived by a lot of things down through the years. There's a lot of things that I thought were innocent and whatever else, and you get to doing the research, and you get to praying about it, and you look up scriptures, and, and you go, oh, man, that's bad. You know, I mean, just a thing of Coca-Cola. I did a little video on that. You know, Coca-Cola originally openly admitted it was made by a pharmacist that put cocaine in it. You know, and then it's, oh, we, we don't put cocaine in it anymore. It's made from coca leaves that where you get cocaine. But don't worry, we take the cocaine out before we make the Coca-Cola. And, and uh, the recipe for Coca-Cola is secret. We won't give you the chemical composition of Coca-Cola, but you can trust us. We make it out of coca where you get cocaine, but there's no cocaine in it. <laughs> you know, and even if there was no cocaine, it still has got high fructose corn syrup and all kinds of other toxic things, phosphoric acid and everything else just wrecks your bones. You know, I mean, people putting, you know, a piece of meat in, in and covering it with Coca-Cola and a little while later, the piece of meat's totally dissolved. And, you know, you can take rust off of nails and things like this with Coca-Cola and clean your toilet, and, you know. And how many of us have drank Coca-Cola? Yeah. See? We have been deceived very, very much. But those people that go into the time of Jacob's trouble, there's a special deception that comes on them from God. Again, how do you reconcile this stuff? How do you put all this stuff together? You say, yes, God's going to send them strong delusion, but God also comforts us as Christians. So it's a comfort knowing that God's going to send us strong delusion. It's insanity. The more you look at the thing, the more you study this, this issue of when the rapture occurs, there's no way it can be anything but before the time of Jacob's trouble. It's just crazy. You know? And of course, you know, if we went into the time of Jacob's trouble, Satan definitely could get an advantage over those Christians that are deceived. God deceives them. He sends them strong delusion. You know? And the devil comes along, has them take the mark of the beast, and... They just lost their salvation. Or God has to make a special exception for those Christians that are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, you know, because they took the mark. And, well, I guess, okay, I guess it's okay for you to take the mark. And, and, but, you know, others can't. Crazy. Let's go next to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 12. says here we are troubled on every side yet not distressed we are perplexed but not in despair persecuted but not forsaken cast down but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the lord jesus that the life also of jesus might be made manifest in our body for we which live are always delivered unto death for jesus sake and the life also of jesus might be made manifest or that the life also of jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh so then death worketh in us but life in you in other words, Paul, what's going on in the book of 2 Corinthians? Paul's giving them some rebukes because they're basically very, very carnal, very wicked. And Paul's saying, hey, we're getting persecuted as Christians. The reason you're not getting persecuted there, Corinthians, is because you're not living right. There's fornication among you. There's all kinds of other things. You're worldly. You're messing around with all this stuff. That's why you're not seeing a lot of the persecution that comes to the, you know, those of us Christians that are disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay, That's what's going on there. But again, you see this thing there of him saying, hey, we're getting kicked around, we're getting killed, we're getting executed, we're getting beaten, we're getting all this other stuff that's happening, but we still have victory. But how does that work if you go into the time of Jacob's trouble? Kind of weird, huh? Um, if we went into that time of Jacob's trouble... And we're in there, and we see the seals being opened up on us, and the trumpets, and, and then the vials, or if you believe that you're not here for that, whatever. 
kooky systems. But if you go through that, um, it's God that's persecuting you. How do you reconcile that stuff? You know? And, you know, I get this thing, too. I see this all the time, you know. Oh, what, the martyrs were killed back, you know, centuries ago by the Catholic Church and things, and there are Christians dying today having their heads cut off. They didn't get raptured. <laughs> well, that's a stupid argument. I mean, they got killed back here in the New Testament. Uh, why, why would you even bring up the rapture with that? It's just like any Christian that's going to have any trouble gets raptured out instantly. Uh, nobody that teaches a, I'll use the term, pre-trib rapture, nobody that teaches that has ever taught that. That's a stupid argument, another stupid argument on the part of the post-tribbers. You know, that any Christian, there should never be a Christian that ever gets persecuted. No, the body of Christ has gone through quite a bit of persecution in the church age. But it's not God that's doing the persecuting. You understand that? It is God when you go into the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the difference. Right now, man can persecute the body of Christ. But when we go up with the Lord, now God has his turn to persecute the earth. That's why the body of Christ can't be here. As it's been well said, God's not a wife beater. Okay, We are the bride of Christ. He's not going to pour out his wrath on us. Very simple to understand. Jump down to verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We live by faith today. Question. Do they live by faith in the time of Jacob's trouble? You say, well, everybody has to have faith. Do they live by faith? Or will there be visible signs of the supernatural in the time of Jacob's trouble? Uh, well, if you read the book of Revelation, I think that there's a few supernatural signs. Things that you can't just go, well, you know, okay, there are a lot of earthquakes, but, you know, there's always been earthquakes. You know, I, I see that. I saw this one time. They said, uh, you know, the, the increase, what appears to be an increase in earthquakes is actually just, we have our equipment can read the earthquakes better now. So they didn't report on as many earthquakes in the past because they didn't have the equipment that we do today. <laughs> like, come on, come on, give me a break. You know, there's a massive increase in earthquakes. All the time. I mean, you, there's so many videos out there on the thing. I mean, just to, this past week, I saw that there was some news report in this, and there's this, you know, news channel or something in California, and they're reporting on an earthquake, and while they're reporting on the earthquake, the studio gets hit by an earthquake. I mean, it's just incredible. But see, you can say, well, you know, you can kind of explain that stuff away, but uh, you aren't going to explain away when the uh, seals are open and the trumpets are blown and the vials are poured out. You ain't going to explain that stuff away. But why then, Paul, why would Paul say, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen? For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What do you do with that? Again, the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, there's signs and wonders that are done. Again, Moses and Elijah, they show up at the beginning and for three and a half years they're over there in the streets of Jerusalem going around preaching and stuff and people come up to stop them and they go and fire comes and devours their enemies. That's what the Bible says. And they're going to be doing all kinds of miracles and things. And I believe that the miracles are going to be actually, some of it's going to be Moses, you know, doing some of the miracles that he did back in the book of Exodus. It's amazing. And yes, the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. I have an, I have an FAQ on that. So you can watch that if you want to see the proof of that, that it is definitely Moses and Elijah. Uh, Elijah. It is not Enoch and Elijah. All right. And there's lots of scripture to prove that. And again, the Jews of today would care less about Enoch. If he showed up, they'd say, oh, well, that's nice. Hi, how you doing? But if you get Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets, uh, you have a pretty powerful witness team there. Okay. And again, why do we need to see that if we're Christians and we go into the time? 
We live by faith, brethren. You have to have faith in what you can't see right now. And there's a whole lot of stuff too, by the way. Let me say this. You can see a lot of the stuff that's coming in the time of Jacob's trouble. You can see it in the news getting more and more and more and more and more. But there's a lot of stuff that's being withheld because the body of Christ is still here on the earth. But when we get caught up, the floodgates are going to open. And there's going to be supernatural things going on, the likes of which no Jew out there that rejects Jesus Christ today, no Jew is going to be able to gainsay nor resist. They're going to look and they're going to go, what do you have to say about this? And I think that the nation of Israel is already starting to wake up. It's very exciting to see that. And I thank the Lord for it. Turn next to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Go down to verse 6 through 8. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Hmm. Verse 6, confidence. Verse 8, confidence. Do you have confidence if you go into the time of Jacob's trouble? And I know it says confident, but I'm saying there's confidence in verse 6 and 8. How can you be confident of anything if you go into the time of Jacob's trouble? First of all, you have God's judgment falling upon you when you've not done anything wrong. <laughs> I mean, you've accepted Jesus Christ. You're part of, part of the bride of Christ. You're part of His body. And yet the judgment's falling on you and hitting you just like it's hitting the lost people. That's a problem. You know, what a comfort that is. You know, uh, how can you be confident? How can you know, hey, the Lord's going to spare us? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that there's going to be pockets of nice areas during the time of Jacob's trouble. And I've actually seen post-tribbers try to come up with this. You know, that they'll, it's like a, the United States is going to be a safe haven during the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, it's like, let's build our survivalist retreats and somehow it'll be a peaceful area where a third of the trees will not burn up and all the green grass won't burn up and, and the rivers and, and the waters and things aren't going to be turned to, to blood. Somehow it's going to, they'll escape it because they'll be there in a safe haven and God will protect it. Where's this stuff at in Scripture? You know, peace is taken completely from the earth in one of the judgments. There's a great earthquake. The whole earth is affected. All the mountains go lay flat. There's no peaceful pockets of resistance with Christians that are, that are enduring to the end to be saved or something. Stupid nonsense. I'll tell you what. We have confidence because we understand our salvation is already paid for. We're going to be going to heaven. You know? We are confident, verse 8, I say and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Amen. But you don't have that confidence if you go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Don't tell me you do. Look at verse 9. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, do you see the little rapture reference there? Present, who's present with the Lord right now? Those that have died and they're present with Him. Or absent, those that are living. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You see it? Over and over and over again in the Pauline epistles. Whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. You know what a great motivating factor is? You want to talk about a... Uh, thing there wherefore we labor you know what's a good uh, good motivation factor and again I'm going to repeat this I repeated it or said it in other studies I'll repeat it one more time if I told you that exactly one year from this very day from this very hour one year from now the Lord is going to be catching away the bride of Christ how would you spend your year if I told you exactly one year from today this very day, this very hour, one year from today, the Antichrist is going to sign that peace treaty. Over in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 27. How are you going to spend your year? 
you know that the time of Jacob's trouble is going to start exactly a year from the day. You know how you're going to spend your, your year? Stocking up. Survival goodies. You're going to get out into the woods someplace and hide away, build some kind of a thing that you can try to survive in order to the end without taking the mark. Sure. But if you believe that the rapture is going to happen in a year, you know how you're going to spend your time? Telling people, warning people. Verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You know something, if you're watching this and you're not saved yet, if you're a Jew or some, somebody else, the terror of the Lord is going to come down on this earth. I mean, when you see a tornado hit some place and it's just vicious, there's just no, no mercy to that tornado. It just goes through and just rips buildings apart and just float, throws things all around. And it's happening all the time. I mean, it happened at Christmas this year, December 25th. It was happening down the south central part of America. That never happened before. The storms that are hitting all the time and the, and the fish that are dead and all kinds of stuff. You know, thousands of fish floating dead and, and all this other. You know what we're seeing? We're seeing the storm clouds on the horizon. We're seeing some, some foretaste of the wrath of God that's going to be coming on this planet. And I'm here today telling you about the terror of the Lord that's going to come. That's why I'm trying to persuade you to get saved right now. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off any further. Don't think to yourself, well, I need to see proof. I'm not convinced of this Jesus stuff. I'm not convinced of this personal relationship and all the Messiah, Jesus, the King, died on the cross. I'm not convinced. You don't want to go into the time where God's going to convince you with what He's doing on the planet. All right, You want to get out before that stuff happens. I mean, if I could have gone back to Nazi Germany before they started the final solution there, basically the, the slaughtering of the Jewish people, if I could go back and tell the Jews and say, hey, I have this bus or whatever else, or I have a train here, um, and it's free admission, hop on, I'll take you to someplace safe. Why? Well, let me show you the pictures of the Holocaust. And people look at that and they go, that's coming here to Germany? Yeah, you see, Adolf Hitler is a Roman Catholic. And the Roman Catholics have always taught replacement theology, so they don't they view you as animals. They don't view you as God's chosen people, that God has a future plan for you. So you see the Catholics will go in and they'll just slaughter Jews with reckless abandon. They always have. So Hitler's a Catholic. Goebbels is a Catholic. Himmler is a Catholic. All these guys are Roman Catholics. Mussolini, Franco in Spain, they're Catholic. They're all in bed with the Roman Catholic Church. I'm here to protect you. I'm here to get you out of the thing. You want to you want a ticket for the train? You want to get on and get out of here before the bad stuff comes? I bet there would have been a lot of Jews that would have said, okay, I'll get on the train. I'll leave. Well, guess what? Right now you have that opportunity. You get saved today. You don't have to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. You can meet your Messiah today and not have to wait till the end of it and see if you survive the thing. You don't have to go into the new death camps that are being built for you. By the way, Germany now is saying... They're printing Mein Kampf again. It used to be illegal that you couldn't even say anything about the Nazis. Now they're printing his book again, Hitler's book. There was a, a statistic that came out this past year, 2015, that the number of Jews in the world is now equal to the pre-Holocaust days. They're preparing another Holocaust. And my burden right now in this ministry is to get to the Jewish people. And make them realize, I'll defend the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel being a wicked nation and everything as it is, rejecting Jesus Christ, sodomy, legal, and all kinds of other stuff over there, lots of abominations. But you know what? They're still God's chosen people. Doesn't mean that they're saved. Doesn't mean they get automatic salvation. No, if you die without accepting Jesus Christ, you go to hell. But you know what? God still has a plan for the nation of Israel. That's the reason for the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the reason for the book of Revelation. That's why the body of Christ is going before, going to go up to be with Jesus before this time starts. That's why I have a burden to speak to the Jewish people. That's why it's there. I know the terror of the Lord. I know what's coming. And you do too if you're a Jew. You know that there's some bad stuff coming. You can read about it back in the book of Daniel. Read Daniel in the book of Revelation sometime. See how they compare but let's continue. 
Jump down to verse 17. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Uh, okay, continuing. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in, in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Okay, you say, well, I don't get it. How does this prove a pre-trade rapture? Well, think about something. Can we as Christians go out and preach to anybody that God will forgive you of all your trespasses? Absolutely. Whatever you've done... The Lord can forgive you for all of it, everything. And he will, he will not impute those trespasses against you. He won't put those in, on your account. Those, those sins, those bad things that you've done that are displeasing in God's sight, they go onto the account of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. He took your sins upon himself. All right? But he will give you his sinless perfect life in exchange. He will impute his righteousness to you. That's why, you know... Uh, that's why you're not going to have those sins come up at the judgment. But if you go on and you reject Jesus Christ, now you have to pay for your own sins. See, that's the issue. But you see, if Christians, if this, if everything that's written in the Pauline epistles is just as good for us today as it will be for those who go into the time of Jacob's trouble, if that's the truth, then how do you preach this to the lost people that have taken the mark of the beast? Huh? How do you preach it to them? I mean... You've taken the, some guy's taken the mark and stuff, and you get your neighbor's taking the mark of the beast. He comes back and he's got whatever the thing is, the implantable microchip in his hand, and tattoo upon his forehead, like it says in Revelation chapter 22, or uh, 20, excuse me. You know, mark upon their forehead. I think it's going to be a couple different things there. You know, visual mark of allegiance upon the forehead, but it's also going to be an implantable microchip, which will go in the hand or in the forehead. So, interesting study. But the point is, you see your neighbor has taken the mark. Are you going to witness to him? This portion right here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says that God can forgive somebody of all their trespasses. Are you going to preach that to somebody who's taken the mark? No. <laughs> Turn next to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 1 and 2. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Hmm. Okay, another problem. You see, Paul apparently contradicted Scripture here, because Paul was a false prophet, <laughs> you know. I debunked that in another study. I have a whole video on that. Um... Paul obviously did not realize that there are multiple virgins in Matthew chapter 25. You know, I mean, if you go to Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, we're not going to go there. You can read about it. But there are ten virgins, five wise, five foolish. Why then would Paul write here, I may present you as a chaste virgin, singular, to Christ? Because right now there is only one. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Not so in the time of Jacob's trouble. Revelation chapter 7 talks about two different groups. 144,000 sealed Jews and people from all kindreds, people, tongue, nations. Hmm. And by the way, I want to make a point which has been brought up, which uh, somebody sent to me and is a very good point, and that is the word Nations. You know, uh, nations in your King James Bible, if you really want to know the right definition of it, nations is not a reference to countries. It's a reference to the ethnicity, nationalities, so to speak. Very interesting. But you see there, again, another scripture which contradicts other New Testament scriptures. If you're trying to make it all teach the same thing. But if you rightly divide the word of truth and you come in and you go, well, look at this. 
the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, is a chaste virgin, singular, that is espoused to Jesus Christ. The virgins of Matthew chapter 25, that's something different. Let me show you that real quickly. Keep your hand there in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Go to Matthew chapter 25. I want to show you a very important word. Every word of God is precious. Every word of God is, is perfect and pure. That's why it's very important to read this. Matthew chapter 25. Uh, let's see here. Verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to marry him. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. No, it doesn't say that. It says, Go ye out to meet him. They're not going out to marry him. They're going out to meet him. They're going to be guests at the wedding. And again, you say, well, No, I don't, I don't agree with that. They're, 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 you know, this is about the bride of Christ and everything else. Okay, how do you get 10 different uh, parts of the, of the bride of Christ? How does that work? And how is it that five of them are wise, five are foolish? You see? So part of the body of Christ that's sealed under the day of redemption gets married to Christ. The other part does not. Why? Well, because they uh, didn't have enough oil and they had to go and buy oil. Okay, and some people say, well, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. Okay, you can buy the Holy Spirit? You know, today in the church age? No, you can't buy the Holy Spirit. But how can you buy righteousness, which is what I believe it is, how can you buy that in the time of Jacob's trouble? Well, turn over to Matthew chapter 25, verse 35. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. And then they go down, and they say, when did we do all that? And Jesus said, when you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Um, so what do they have at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble? Good works. That, that's what determines whether they get into the millennial kingdom or not. See? You can buy that righteousness. You're going to have to work for your own righteousness at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. So I don't believe that's, that's heretical. It's by faith alone. You know, <laughs> I get that thing. It's by faith alone, by grace through faith alone. It's always going to be that way. You're crazy. You can't read plain English. Show me anywhere in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 down through verse 46. Show me one place where faith shows up. Show me one. Show me one place where it says that you had faith in Jesus Christ, therefore you get into the kingdom. Show me one. It's not in there. Hmm. Interesting. I guess you maybe ought to rightly divide the word of truth. Maybe you ought to actually look and say, you know what, this obviously would contradict this portion over here, so obviously it can't be for me. This portion of the book of Matthew lines up with what Paul is saying, so that part there, instruction in righteousness, sure, it's for me. There are certain doctrines which overlap different dispensations. There are certain ones that don't. I know that takes a little bit more work, you know. But, uh, you know, you're not supposed to approach the King James Bible like a fast food restaurant. You know, drive through the drive through and I want my meal in five minutes or less. Kind of a weird thing. But again, proven by Scripture. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Huh, we're here. <laughs> Well, let's continue. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 through 4. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, whom ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Okay. Uh... Why didn't Paul warn about taking the mark of the beast? And there's a perfect example. Paul's saying, hey, some false prophet's going to come along. He's going to be preaching another gospel there, another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. Why didn't he warn about Christians taking the mark of the beast? I mean, I've known Christians that get messed up in some 
you know, bad doctrine, and yet they're still saved. They come back to the Lord. They go, oh, man, you know, I can't believe I fell for that guy. I was really starting to listen to him. I thought he was good and whatever else. and <sighs> I can't believe I fell for that. You know, they, they repent of it, and they get right with God again. But uh, if we're going into the time of Jacob's trouble, wouldn't Paul have been somewhat remiss in his duties? I mean, why didn't he warn us about taking the mark of the beast? Uh, here's a hint. Because we don't have to worry about it. We're not going into the time of Jacob's trouble. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body or I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. You know, again, I see this with some of these post-tribbers. They'll say, there's not anything in Scripture about Christians being called up. You know, there's nothing in there. We're supposed to, we're the salt and light of the earth. We're going to stay on the earth. That's what we're here for. You know, uh, well, Paul was called up. You say, was that the preacher rapture? No. But the point is, he was called up. Let's continue. Kind of debunks that theory, doesn't it? That these people say. Verse 3. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, I've always kind of wondered about that verse, and I think to myself, you know, what on earth would he hear up there that it's, it's unspeakable and you're not allowed to utter it? Hmm. Interesting. Let me show you my theory. Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10, verse 4. This is John in heaven. Now, you know, I, the thought occurred to me. I thought, well, maybe, you know, when Paul's saying about, I knew such a man that was caught up, you know, and to the third heaven and he heard unspeakable words, I thought maybe this is what he's talking about. Let's read the verse. I'll show you why I think that. Uh, and when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunder, thunders uttered, and write them not. And see, I, I looked at that, and I thought, could that be that Paul was talking about John? He says there uh, he, how that he was caught up, Second uh, Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Over there it says, The seven thunders uttered and write them not. Seal it up. Don't write it. And so I got to thinking, I thought, maybe Paul's referring to John. But then you look at it and you go, No, that wouldn't make any sense because Paul says over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, he says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Now, most people will say that the 2 Corinthians was written somewhere right around 50 to 60 A.D., someplace in there. You know, can you be exact about it? Well, I don't know. But they'll say it about that time frame. But the book of Revelation was written in 90 A.D. So if Paul is saying, we'll go with 60 A.D., that 2 Corinthians, the letter there was written, Paul says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. So more than 14 years ago. But let's just say, we'll just go with 14. So you have... 60 minus 14 would be 46. So 46 A.D. That's a lot earlier than 90 A.D. when John would have written Revelation. So Paul is not speaking about John in this passage. Who is Paul speaking about? Well, if you go back to the book of Acts, there's a point where Paul is actually stoned to death. And they carry him outside of the city. I think it was Lystra. And they, they plop him down. And they're all standing around going, Oh, man, I can't believe he got killed, you know, and stuff. And all of a sudden, you know, the Lord, you know, brings Paul back down into his body and says, you know, get back in there. You've got to do some more preaching yet. And Paul stands up and, you know, bloodied and everything else and bruised and walks back into the city. All right, I'm here to tell you about Jesus. You know, <laughs> they're probably going, didn't we just stone him? You know, <laughs> pretty incredible. But uh, what was going on there then? Okay, this wasn't John, it was Paul. He's talking about 
what he saw. You know, he's saying, I'm a sinner here on this earth, so I'm not going to talk about my sinful flesh. What I will glory in is that redeemed soul that went up there to be with the Lord and those things that I saw up there. It talks another place about, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Okay, what happened? Paul stepped out of time and went into eternity. Could it be that uh, Paul heard some things up there about the future? And the Lord said, don't utter those things when you go back down. Unspeakable things. I don't know. The Bible does not give us every answer to the things that are written in here. Okay, there are some things the just shall live by faith. And all we know is Paul got called up to heaven there and he heard some things and he saw some things and he got sent back down and the Lord said, don't tell anybody about that. Which is very ironic because you get all these wingnut charismaniacs and they'll come down and they'll say, I died. I was, I was clinically dead for 24 hours or something and, and I'm going to tell you about everything that I saw. And, you, and then you listen to what they saw in heaven, and it's completely unscriptural. They got women angels with wings, you know, not one in the entire Bible, Old or New Testaments. You know, they see Michael Jackson in prison in hell or something like this. It's, oh, well, you know, jail cell in hell or something. What? You know? I did a study on that too, the thing of uh, um, dreams and near-death experiences and stuff. Don't believe that stuff, okay? Very, very, very ridiculous. But again, you say, well, what is this? How does this prove the pre-trib rapture? Well, it shows that the body of Christ, that there were at least two men that went up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, you know, Paul definitely came back down. John, some say he came back down after the book of Revelation. I don't really see that in Scripture. They say, well, according to tradition, well, uh, tradition, I don't know. But the point is, again, you know, these people will just take dogmatic stands. No Christians are removed. Christians are not supposed to be removed from the earth. There's none of that stuff. You won't see it anywhere in scriptures. There's another example. Another one. But let's continue. Next, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. Here's another good one. You want to pin a post-tribber? Here's a good one. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. It begins with comfort. God gives us comfort. It ends with comfort. Be of good comfort. Comfort one another with these words. Listen to the hymn, Face to Face with Christ my Savior. It will comfort you. Be of one mind. We can right now in the church age. Live in peace. Uh-oh. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Until we get to the time of Jacob's trouble. Then God's not going to be the God of love anymore. He's going to be the terror and, and everything else. And He's going to be bringing His wrath upon us. And, and we're going to get to see Him judging us day after day after day. Along with the wicked. Um, so he's not really going to be the God of love and peace at that point. But, you know, you say, I don't understand. Where's the contradiction? It says there, live in peace. Second Corinthians chapter 11, or excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Live in peace. Keep your hand right there in Second Corinthians chapter 13. And go to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Are you listening, post-tribbers? Because we just got your number. Proof, 100% proof, that the body of Christ cannot go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Because it would cause Scripture to contradict. You'd make God into a liar. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Live in peace. Revelation chapter 6, verse 3. 
And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Hmm. We have a contradiction. Unless you're a King James Bible believing, pre trib rapture believer. Pre time of Jacob's trouble, catching away of the bride of Christ, if you want to be really technical about it. You see the problem you get into when you mess with the book? When you don't accept and rightly divide Scripture? Second Corinthians, a Christian, is told, live in peace. Revelation chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. The red horse rider takes peace from the earth. You can't live in peace if you go into that time. You say, well, yeah, but we're being persecuted by the world. But in persecution, we can have peace knowing that we rest in God. Uh, no, because God is the one who just unleashed the red horse rider. It's not the first part of the tribulation is man coming against the body of Christ and persecuting the saints. That isn't it at all. It all starts with Jesus Christ. Right here in Revelation chapter 6, it all starts with Him opening the first seal and unleashing the Antichrist. God causes the whole thing from start to finish. It's God through the second horse rider that takes peace from the earth. But over in 2 Corinthians 13, He's telling you to live in peace. You see, the whole post-trib structure makes God into a liar. That's why I call it satanic. That's why I call these people heretics. If you believe in the post-trib or pre-wrath, post-trib, mid-trib, whatever, if you believe in any of that stupid nonsense, you're not right with God. You might be saved. You might be saved, but you're out of fellowship with the Lord. I'll tell you that. I've seen these people. I've been around these people for years and years and years. Survival prepping and all this other stuff. You're not right with God as a post-tribber. Scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture debunks your stupid system. I just showed you another one right there, big one. And yet, I don't see any clear scriptures that prove a pre-trib rapture. Well, maybe it's because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Maybe it's because you're dead spiritually. You might have the uh, remote control, but there aren't any batteries in it. Like I've talked about in other studies. You say, what are you talking about? You might understand some parts of this book because you've been taught certain things. But until you have been quickened by the Holy Spirit of promise, until you are alive spiritually, this book is going to be a dead book to you. It's not going to make sense. You know, I'm convinced more and more that a lot of these post-trib, pre-wrath, post-trib, mid-trib, whatever, these people, I think a lot of them are right in their beliefs. They are going through the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm not. I'm saved. I'm redeemed. Born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. Sealed under the day of redemption. I can live in peace. And yes, I can have peace. Even if I'm being tortured someplace by a bunch of stupid Jesuits or something. Or another inquisition or whatever else. I can still have peace. You know why? Because I know that my God is not causing it. I know that it's not God that opened a seal to send the Catholic inquisitors to my home to torture myself. You see? I know that I'm sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. I don't have to worry. Oh no, I took the mark. I've lost my salvation. I have comfort. I am confident. You see? No other religion can give you the confidence that you have as a Bible-believing Christian. You see that? Well, I hope that I'm going to be saved. Roman Catholic. Well, if I take the uh, Mass and I Read my uh, catechism. Looking for one here. Of course, they're all over the place, you know, with our research. But, you know, we have catechisms and stuff somewhere. <laughs> uh, 
canons and decrees of the Council of Trent. We got the Second Vatican Council there. The church teaches there. Whatever. Doesn't matter. You know, we got them around. You've seen them in other studies. Don't need to prove it. But the point is, a Catholic, a Roman Catholic comes around and they say, well, I believe that if I take the Mass enough, and if I continue to stay and live in a state of grace, I might be saved. The Muslim says, if I do holy jihad or something like this, or follow the pervert prophet Muhammad, you know, and if I rape enough young girls and things and go in and destroy enough people's countries and things like this and, and whatever, if I, if I do what the prophet has told me to do, I might be saved. The Jew if I do enough alms and prayers and if I keep the traditions of the elders and if I live by the Talmud and the, and the Torah and, and if I live by all these things and if I'm a good person, I might be able to make it into the resurrection. And if I have a son that can pray me out of that thing and keep praying for me and stuff like that and saying prayers and whatever, I might make it. Let me show you what the Bible says. The New Testament. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. You know what Jesus said in John chapter, I think it's 11, I think it is, uh, we're talking about the Lazarus and things, and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the rapture, which I've said before. Jesus Christ is when we get called up, dead in Christ rise, and then we which are alive and remain, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And you think that means well, we're going to meet Jesus. Well, we're going to meet Jesus, but we're going to meet the body of Christ as well. The first time ever that that redemption of the purchased possession now has become one. Our salvation, Paul wrote, and he said, now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. You see? Your salvation is not complete, Christian, until the rapture. Then you're truly saved at that point. And I don't mean you have to live in a state of grace or anything else. That's when our bodies are redeemed. Right now, I'm getting older. I'm getting more gray hair. Got some up in here, too. But especially with the you know, ministry that I'm in. <laughs> I mean, yeah, my flesh is corruptible. Your flesh is corruptible. But it won't be when we go to be with the Lord. We receive incorruptible bodies. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 58. But let's continue here. Uh, verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Not in religion. Not in church buildings or attendance or baptism or whatever else. It's in His Son. Do you know Jesus Christ personally? Verse 12, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You say, well, we are Muslims. We believe that Jesus was a prophet. You don't have life. You have to believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, that he is God manifest in the flesh. If he was just a man like Muhammad, his death on the cross would mean anything. His blood couldn't do a thing to save you. Why? Blood's corruptible, unless it's God's blood. Like Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says. You see? If you're Jewish, you say, well, I don't have Jesus Christ, the Son of God, because I don't believe He was the Son of God. I don't believe He was a good man, perhaps, maybe. I don't know. But uh, He wasn't our Messiah. Then you don't have eternal life. You say, well, I've done the right things. I've kept the... You, ha you don't have eternal life. Sorry. The plan of salvation is through Jesus Christ. You say, well, we're Catholics. We have Jesus. No, you don't. You have a wafer. A little cookie that you eat and you drink the wine and you say, I'm re-sacrificing Christ every day on the altar or whenever you go to Mass. Probably not that devout to go every day, you know. But you believe that you have to continually, continually, continually re-sacrifice Christ. Then why on earth did he say on the cross, it is finished? If he needs to be re-sacrificed. You don't have Jesus Christ either. And your prayers have to go through Mary or some other intercessor, another saint. Saint Stinky Poo for your sore toe or st Saint Runny Nose for your, you know, whatever. No, your prayers go to Jesus, through Jesus, to God. 
look at verse 13. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written, King James Bible, unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You know how you have comfort? You know how you have confidence? You know how? And how you have peace in this life? By believing a written record. You're looking at it. This book, if you speak English, this is the book for you. King James Bible. This is your written record. You know, I own this place that we're in right here. You know how I know? Because I have the paperwork for it. Anybody can come along here and they could say, I don't believe that that's your place. So, okay, come on in, look at my files. Right there it is. Paid for. And we didn't pay very much for it. It's in rough shape. But the point is, it's mine. We paid for it. I have the records to prove it. I'm saved. I'm born again. How do I know? I have a record. My sins have been paid for. And I can prove it. That means I'm confident. I can't do anything like take a mark of the beast and lose my salvation. You see? See how that works? I can live in peace. I don't have to worry about a red horse rider being unleashed by my Savior on the earth to take peace away from the earth. I don't have to worry about it. I've said this many times, and I'll say it one more time. I repeat myself a lot, if you haven't noticed. Your salvation is the single most important thing on this earth. If you are post-trib, and you just refuse to accept these truths that you've seen in this study, make sure that you're saved. Check yourself. Examine yourself. It says about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. I have my Bible closed, but we'll go back there. Because I want you to see this. You know, there's a lot of people going around on the Internet right now, a lot of uh, false prophets, a lot of people that call themselves preachers or, or, you know, that they've been called into some kind of ministry and they haven't been called. Uh, God's seal of approval has never been on them. They're probably not even saved, most of them. But they'll tell you, if you believed, if you, as long as you believe that Jesus died for your sins, you're a Christian. It doesn't matter. You know, don't agonize over it. Don't think about it. Don't say to yourself, Are, man, I'm, am I sure? You know, don't do that. No, no, no. It's not that big of a deal. Um, let me tell you something. Your salvation is the greatest and most important thing in, the, in your life. There's nothing else that's more important. Your driver's license is not more important. Your job, your health, your money, whatever. It all comes in second place to your salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Examine yourself. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates? Do you know that Jesus Christ is in you? Are you saved? When he calls his bride home, are you going? You say, yeah, brother, I, I, I know. I know for sure. I know I've come to the Lord as a sinner. I know that I've, I've, there's nothing else I could have brought. I can't bring my own righteousness to the thing. I can't try to work my way into heaven and die in a state of grace or something. All I have, you know, is... Just my sinful, wicked life. And I came to the Lord and I said, Lord, God, please save me. And I know He saved me. I know what the Word of God says, and I trust that this record is true. Okay? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Are you persuading men? Or are you preparing to endure to the end? Preparing to stock up for this time period that's coming? What are you doing? How are you spending your life? Are you confident? Do you have comfort? Are you living in peace? You know, when I see reports of wild disasters, fires in California and floods in, in England and, and tornadoes down in the southwest or south or southern south central part of America, excuse me, and I see all these terrible things and it's we didn't get any snow, you know, in December here and you know and and but they're getting snow out west, record snowfall, and, and it's 70 degrees here in, in the east coast and things. In the, you know, 
You know when I see that? It brings me comfort, brings me joy. You know why? Because I realize face to face with Christ my Savior, when with rapture I behold Him, Jesus Christ who died for me. I know I'm going home soon. I don't have to look and go, oh no, Antichrist is going to show up soon and I might not make it. What if, what if I take the mark of the beast and all this work, all this years of ministry, all the books I've read and everything else I've done, it's all gone because I took the mark. You call that comfort? You call that joy? You call that peace? You better think about this stuff. Let's close, close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank You for the amazing comfort that comes from reading Your Word and from understanding, Lord, that we have proof that we're going to be leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble. We can have that, be confident, and know that our salvation is fixed, it's secure, and that uh, we're going to have that time where we're going to go to be with You and, and all of us that are saved are going to finally meet face to face and we're going to have joy unspeakable. I thank you for that promise, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that uh, the saved out there would not get sidetracked watching all sorts of false prophets and falling for the lie that we have to look at both sides. We don't have to look at liars, Lord. We don't have to look at false prophets. Your word tells us to avoid them. Mark them, which calls divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. It says over in Romans chapter 16, we're to avoid false prophets, Lord. We don't have to listen to them. We don't have to have them tear our faith down in the imminent return of you. And uh, that's why, Lord, I just pray that you would help us all to continue and to stay in your word, to be stubborn, Lord, in terms of not moving, unmovable, steadfast, uh, that we would not be swayed from our position of understanding the peace that you've given us through your blood that you shed on the cross. And Lord, if there's anybody out there that has not come to that point of salvation, Lord, I do pray that you would please convict them and help them to realize that the times that are coming, they are going to see it get worse and worse and worse, and that they might face your wrath by taking the mark of the beast. I just pray, Lord, that they would get saved, that they would see the imminent signs that are, that are pointing to the soon catching away of the bride of Christ, that they would get a ticket for that train, as I said about earlier, and get out before it gets bad. And I just ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that's going to be that study. I've got a bunch of more videos I'm going to be doing today. Some very interesting things. See if I can get it all done. But uh, just wanted to make a little comment here um, about the comments. And uh, that is I've, I've been contacted now a couple times by different people asking why their comments are disappearing. Um, I'm not deleting your comments. If you're one of the faithful, you know, if you're like saying, hey, thank you for doing the study, I'm not deleting your comments. Okay, I will, you know, the only comments I delete, just boom, are ones that have profanity or some kind of uh, foul, dirty, perverse types of stuff in them. Uh, boom, those comments are gone. Um, people that come in and say, have questions and whatever else, I'll typically do the, the thing in Titus chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, it talks about a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. <clears throat> I'll do that, typically. I will usually give people a couple chances, and some people get a lot more than that. I go a little bit further because I'll have more grace for them, and they just sit. I don't know where they're at with the Lord and whatever else, but I'm not, I don't normally delete comments. Again, I'm too busy to be going in there and looking at every comment and deleting them. And I mean, I got onto my YouTube channel this morning, and it's like, it comes up, you know, the most recent comments you have, you go into Creator Studio and it shows videos and then it shows your comments, most recent comments. It's showing comments that some of you left two weeks ago. And yet I click on the page and it shows comments that have come out in the last 24 hours. And So there's all kinds of weird stuff going on with my account. Um, people that I've banned, blocked, both from Google Plus, from YouTube, they're coming back in and I'm going, okay, you know, what's this all about? Uh, so, you know, the, if you had your comments deleted, please don't be offended. Again, I think that there's a, there's a conspiracy there, truly, that somehow 
some people at Google or something. You know, I don't believe that my account has been hacked. Um, I think it's people that have administrator privileges where they can get in without passwords and whatever else. People that are controlling the website. And I think what they're doing is they're coming in and they're deleting people's comments specifically to make it look like I'm deleting your comments so that you feel hurt and you feel like, why would he delete my comments? I, don't, I thought Brother Brian would have appreciated what I said. Why would he delete it? I'm not deleting them, okay? And what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, okay, look, he's deleting your comments. Isn't he so mean? Unsubscribe from him because he's so wretchedly evil and stuff. I'm not deleting the comments. So I don't know anything else to do other than just to continually talk about what these people are doing on my account to keep you aware and to keep you praying for this situation. So if your comments have been deleted, um, I'm sorry. I do apologize for that. It's out of my control. Okay? And if you're watching this and you're one of the people that's deleting the comments, you're doing this thing uh, spitefully and whatever else, um, let me just say, you're going to stand before God. And I know that doesn't really scare you that much right now. But that, that day is going to come to an end. Um, what you're getting away with right now, your, your sin. The Bible talks about the pleasures of sin for a season. You are in your season of sin right now. And that time is going to come when that season is going to end. And you're going to stand before a holy, righteous, pure God. And you're going to give an account to Him. And you will answer to Him. So you can persecute me all you want, you hypocrites that talk about intolerance and bigotry and whatever else. Call me that, and yet you practice it on me. You can do that all you want right now. Your season is coming to an end. And I'm saying this stuff as your friend to try and warn you. I know the terror of the Lord. That's why I'm here trying to persuade men. Okay? So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you in the next video.